and welcome to Neo Psychology with me, your teacher, Mr. Neo, the channel where I teach online psychology lessons for my wonderful students. We're starting a new unit today. It's the memory unit and we're looking at lesson one, short and long term memory. Let's get started. Starter, how can we improve our memory? What's the difference between short and long term memory? How are some memories recalled and others are lost forever? That's what we're going to be looking at today. Our everyday experience of memory is that there are two main types. Some are brief and are quickly forgotten, short term memory, but others can last a very long time indeed, long term memory. Short term and long term memory are often distinguished in terms of their coding, capacity and duration. So. We're going to have a look at outlining and evaluating research into coding, capacity and duration for both short term and long term memory today. Let's start with coding. Information that we store has to be written in memory in some form. It is described as a code in which it is held in the form of sounds acoustically, images visually or meaning semantically. Procedure. Alan Badley, 1966, gave different lists of words to four groups of participants to remember. Acoustically similar words, e.g. cat, cab, can, or acoustically dissimilar words, for example, pit, few, cow, and semantically similar words, for example, great, large, big, or semantically dissimilar words, for example, huge, good, hot. Here are the findings. Badly hypothesized that short-term memory is coded acoustically and long-term memory is, co is coded semantically. So when participants were asked to recall acoustically similar words, because the short-term memory was over-inundated, immediate recall was worse with acoustically similar words. This demonstrates that short-term memory codes information acoustically. Recall after 20 minutes was worse with semantically similar words. This demonstrates that long-term long -term memory codes information semantically. Badly found that information in the short-term memory is coded acoustically and information in the long-term memory is coded semantically. Let's have a look at evaluating. What are the strengths and limitations of research into coding? Short-term memory may be exclusively acoustic. Some studies have found that visual codes are also used in short-term memory. Brandimo et al. in 1992 found that participants used visual codes in short-term memory when they were given pictures to remember and prevented from verbally rehearsing. This suggests there might be multiple types of coding in short-term memory and that short-term memory is not just acoustically, uh, acoustically coded, but it could also be visually coded. So this is a, is this a strength or limitation? It's a limitation. One strength of Badley's study into coding is that it is generalizable. Badley had a large sample of 72 participants. Any anomalies people will use, will, uh, people with unusually good or bad memories will be averaged out in a sample size of 72, which is a decent amount. This suggests you can generalize the findings from this sample to the wider population. Is this a strength or limitation? The fact that it's generalizable means it's a strength. So, coding. Can you identify one thing you've learned about coding? Why do you think learning about coding is important? What was the hardest part to understand about coding? And what questions has coding raised for you? Feel free to put them in the comments. Coding. We're one third of the way through. Let's have a look at capacity. Capacity concerns how much data can be held in a memory store. Long-term memory has a potentially infinite, unlimited capacity. But how much information can short-term memory hold at one time? What is its capacity? Here's the procedure by Jacobs in 1987. Joseph Jacobs researched the capacity of short-term memory by measuring digit span. Jacobs read out four digit numbers and the participants had to recall these out loud in the correct order. If correct, the researcher reads out five digits and so on until the participants cannot recall the order correctly. This indicates the individual's digit span. 
Jacobs found that the mean span for digits across all participants was 9.3 items and the mean span for letters was 7.3 items. So the capacity of short-term memory, according to Jacobs, is around 9.3 items if it's digits and about 7.3 items if letters. Research. What's your digit span? I'm going to read out a series of numbers and we will see how many you can remember, i.e. what is your digit span. So I'm going to read out a series of numbers and you're, you have to just repeat them out loud and we're going to see what is your digit span. 2, 4, 8, 1. You need to say it out loud. Did you get it right? 2, 4, 8, 1. 4, 5, 6, 2, 9. There we go. 7, 4, 5, 8, 2, 4. Next one. 3, 5, 6, 4, 8, 7, 5. Four one three six five eight nine three. Eight one six three six five nine one two. Nine zero oh, four six two four five four two three. And the last one, two seven seven eight zero oh, one two one five seven nine. Did you get that one right? Right. Whichever one you couldn't do, you couldn't say out loud. Your your digit span is the one before that, right? Whichever one was the highest one you could do. Okay. According to Jacob's research, most people could remember between 9.3 items if it's digits, right? How did you do? Did you do more than nine, less than nine? If it was letters, around 7.3 items. And that's related to capacity. Further research into capacity were done by George Miller in 1956, suggested seven plus or minus two. George Miller made observations of everyday practice. Miller thought that the span, i.e. capacity, of short-term memory is about seven items plus or minus two. But he also noted that people can recall five words as easily as they can recall five letters. We do this by chunking, grouping sets of digits or letters into units or chunks. So, research into Miller's 7 plus or minus 2 capacity. On the next slide, I'm going to show you various images. You will have 10 seconds to look at all the images on the board and then independently write down how many you can recall. Okay? You ready? Here's a 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right. Pause the video, how many can you remember? Write them down. And I'm gonna give you the answers now. There we go, owl, moon, sock, door, baby, clock, vase, syringe, table, cherries, pencil and lock. How many did you get? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Out of 12 there is. And let's have a look at the evaluation of capacity. What are the strengths and what are the limitations of research into capacity? One limitation of Miller's research is that it may overestimate short-term memory capacity. So for example, Cohen in 2001 reviewed other research into short-term memory. He concluded that the capacity of short-term memory was only about four plus or minus one chunk, not the seven plus or minus two which Miller suggested. This suggests that the lower end of Miller's estimate, five items, is more appropriate than the seven. Is this a strength or limitation? This is a limitation. This is conflicting evidence by Cohen. 
the size of the chunks matter. Research has shown that the size of the chunk affects the number of chunks that can be remembered. Simon found that people have a smaller memory span for larger chunks. For example, multi-syllable words, which take longer to rehearse compared to single syllable words. This supports the view that the short term memory has a limited capacity despite the benefits of chunking. So the size of the chunks matter. And that is capacity. Can you identify one thing you've learned about capacity? Why do you think learning about capacity is important? And what was the hardest part to understand about capacity? How was your capacity? How was your memory span? The final element we're looking at today in terms of short and long-term memory is duration. Duration. Peterson and Peterson. Margaret and Lloyd Peterson gave 24 students a, a consonant syllable, such as YCG, to remember. They were also given three-digit numbers to count backwards from. The counting backwards was to prevent any mental rehearsal of the consonant syllable. The retention interval was varied. Sometimes they had to rate three seconds or up to 18 seconds. So you have to remember uh, consonant syllables. After three seconds, the average recall was about 90%. So 90% of people could recall uh, those three syllable letters after three seconds. However, after 18 seconds, the average recall was about 3%. Peterson and Peterson concluded uh, found that the short-term memory duration may be about 18 seconds unless you've repeated the information over and over i.e verbal rehearsal so when you get asked to remember something you say it again in your head you verbally rehearse it and that can prolong the duration of how long you can keep it in your short-term memory however if verbal rehearsal is prevented the duration of short-term memory is about 18 seconds according to peterson and peterson's research Here's another procedure by Barik et al. in 1975, looking at the duration of long-term memory at this time. Barik et al. studied 392 American participants aged between 17 and 74. High school yearbooks were obtained from the participants or directly from some schools. Recall was tested in two ways. One, photo recognition test, which consisted of 50 photos, some of the participants' high school yearbooks. And two, a free recall test, where participants recalled all the names of their graduating class. What was found? Participants in the photo recognition test were 90% accurate after 15 years and 70% accurate after 48 years. Participants in the free recall test were 60% accurate after 15 years and 30% accurate after 48 years. This shows that long-term memory may last up to a lifetime for some material. Right? The fact that 70% accuracy after, 50, uh, after 48 years is as good as a lifetime. Right? You, that's, that's a long, long time. Right, let's have a look at the evaluation. What are some of the strengths and limitations of research into duration? One limitation of Peterson and Peterson's study is the meaningless stimuli. At times in life, we do not need to recall random letters and words. Sorry. At times in life, we do need to recall random letters and words, but this is few and far between. Recall of consonant syllables does not reflect meaningful everyday memory tasks. Therefore, the study lacked external validity and mundane realism. It doesn't reflect everyday life. We aren't generally asked to remember random letters and numbers. One limitation of Peterson and Peterson's study is that is a meaningless stimuli. That is a limitation. One strength of Barik et al. study is that it did have high external validity. Everyday meaningful memories, for example, of people's faces and names, were studied. When lab studies were done with meaningless pictures to be remembered, recall rates were lower. This means that Barik et al. study findings reflect a more real estimate of the duration of long-term memory. This is a strength. Here's an application question for you guys, okay? Petra's cake. Petra is making a cake. On reading the recipe, she finds that she does not have 10 of the ingredients in her cupboard. She drives 20 minutes to a local supermarket, but on arrival, realizes she cannot remember what ingredients she needs to buy. 
Using your knowledge of short-term memory, explain why Petra can't remember the ingredients she needs to buy. Try to use those, uh, try to incorporate those key terms that we've learned about so far in the lesson. Right? Give yourself five minutes, pause the, pause the video, read the question, quote parts of the question in your answer, give that a go now, please. Right. Let's have a look through the answer. The list of ingredients for the cake was held in her short-term memory. However, when driving 20 minutes to the supermarket, she did not rehearse the items, and so the memory decayed, as short-term memory has a very limited duration of only 18 seconds. Furthermore, as she needed to remember 10 ingredients, this may be more than the capacity of short-term memory, 7 plus or minus 2, and so all of the items could not be recalled. One way to help her remember the ingredients would be to chunk items together or code them into her long-term memory semantically. And that is duration. Can you identify one thing you learned about duration? Why do you think learning about duration is important? What was the hardest part to understand about duration? And what questions has this raised for you? That's learning objective three done. We're on to the plenary now. Can you complete the definitions below? Short-term memory is the limited capacity memory store. In short-term memory, coding is mainly what? Acoustic. Capacity is between 5 and 9, 7 plus or minus 2 items on average, and duration is about 18 seconds. In long-term memory, the permanent memory store, in long-term memory, coding is mainly semantic. It has what capacity? An unlimited capacity and can store memories for up to a lifetime. And that was today's lesson. That was lesson one, short and long-term memory. Uh, tune in for lesson two, the multi-store model. Well done, my neo-psychologist. Great job today. I've been Mr. Neo. God bless and peace. I'm feeling like Will. I feel like a prince. I'm feeling myself. I'm loaded with bills. Because I was not blessed with no Uncle Phil. Don't know how it feels. I wanted to flex. They told me to chill. I'm making a flip. My life is a flick. Now load up the flip. Yeah.